This is the Republic XR12 Rainbow. To this day, it's the world's fastest four-engine piston-powered airplane, but it was never put into production. And we're going to tell you why in Celebrating Aviation with Mike Machat. This is all about photo reconnaissance, the need for information for battlefield commanders, uh, the imagery produced uh, from airplanes at high altitude. This photo taken in World War II uh, from 20,000 feet showing potential targets. Uh, and then after attacks, it was used for battle damage assessment and it provided vital information. And the need for photo reconnaissance became very, very important. Early uh, photographers literally were hanging out the rear cockpits of existing airplanes, hanging on to their cameras. And the need for speed in developing the images and getting them to battlefield commanders as soon as possible uh, necessitated things like this mobile field unit with a portable dark room where they could develop the photos as soon as they were downloaded from the airplanes. But uh, by 1943, the Army Air Forces was looking for a dedicated airplane uh, that could uh, fulfill the photo reconnaissance mission with the speed of the converted fighters like this F-6D Mustang and the range of converted bombers, or in this case, the Northrop P-61 Black Widow converted into the F-15 Reporter. Howard Hughes of the Hughes Aircraft Company in Culver City, California, and the Republic Aviation Corporation in Farmingdale, New York, answered the Army's request for proposal. Republic built a P-47 Thunderbolt fighter, and there was an experimental version, the XP-72, which was fitted with a 3,000 horsepower Pratt & Whitney R4360 uh, radial engine uh, fitted to contra-rotating propellers. This was a 28-cylinder, it was called the Wasp Major, uh, and it was the most powerful production piston engine uh, ever made. But if you look at the XP-72, uh, take a look at the fuselage with the uh, turbo supercharger. And if you were to remove the wings and the tail of this airplane, you essentially have the nacelle of what became Republic's long range photo recon airplane. The mock-up took shape in 1944. And you notice the unique clear uh, nose section, which was actually an army contract requirement. Uh, they were mandating that the uh, pilot and co-pilot had full 360 degree forward, upward and downward vision uh, to assist the photo crew in identifying targets. They built a mock-up of the nose section and mounted it on top of a Studebaker pickup truck uh, and drove it up and down the runways at Farmingdale. It's at the exact height and uh, angle of, the, uh, of what the airplane would be uh, looking like when it was built. Uh, and this was to solve problems in visibility at night or in rain, in bad weather. There was a lot of distortion. And the solution was to put a flat windshield at the front of the cockpit. This, was the, this became the pressure bulkhead. And the fairing ahead of it, the streamlined bullet-shaped fairing, uh, was just basically empty with ambient air. This is a photo of that structure. It's pretty robust. The airplane had a uh, service ceiling of 40,000 feet. Uh, and yet the uh, in interior was pressurized to 10,000 feet. Here's ship one under construction in building 17 at Farmingdale. Uh, the nose is covered with a tarp to protect the uh, plexiglass surfaces, but the airplane is taking shape here just as the engines are being mounted. The airplane was rolled out in December of 1945. The World War II had already ended uh, and the need for the airplane uh, was a bit less, but they still went ahead with uh, uh, the flight test. And so uh, what uh, happened then was engine run-ups, system tests, uh, testing of all the onboard uh, systems to prepare for the first flight. The crew for that flight, uh, which you see here from left is uh, Lowry Brabham, chief test pilot of Republic. In the middle is Oscar Bud Haas, head of flight test department. And on the right is James Creamer, the flight test engineer on the first flight of the airplane. That took place on a cold, crisp morning of February 4th, 1946. And here's ship one uh, with all four engines revving up. But uh, if you look in the background, look at that car over by the blast fence and realize that there's 20 years between that automobile and this airplane. Pretty impressive. The airplane leaped into the air and used half of the 6,800 foot runway at Farmingdale. And uh, Brabham said it was just uh, the hottest airplane he'd ever flown. Uh, and that was on February 4th. You notice the company personnel over there by the hangar all uh, uh, took some time off to go see the first flight. 
The second first flight, if you can call it that, was on February 7th. And this was for uh, the press, or as we call it today, the media. And so they had all the uh, uh, newspaper representatives, radio uh, out there on the field. And this became the official public first flight on February 7th of 1946. The airplane looked good from any angle. Uh, it was considered chief designer Alexander Cartvelli's masterpiece. Just a beautifully aerodynamic airplane, powerful and really fast. The top speed was uh, 462 miles per hour at 40,000 feet. And here we see it uh, in the, uh, all its elegance and graceful shape. It was just really one of the most aesthetically beautiful airplanes ever built. We're starting to get some media attention. Here it is on the cover of Flying Magazine. And again, you can see that rakish angle of the uh, fuselage on the ground. But in Culver City, uh, Howard Hughes was preparing the competing XF-11, which was a twin engine design uh, using the same uh, R4360 radials fitted to the original contra-rotating propeller configuration. And you see the cameras there in the nose section of the airplane. Uh, it first flew on uh, July 7th, 1946, it made its first and only flight. Uh, this is purportedly the last photo ever taken of the airplane as it lifted off from uh, Hughes Airport in Culver City. 45 minutes later, uh, it crashed uh, in a residential neighborhood in Beverly Hills attempting to land on a golf course after an in-flight emergency with the right-hand propeller. We're gonna save that story for a future video. Hughes was badly burned in the accident uh, but thankfully he survived and was nursed back to health. And a year later, on April 4th of 1947, he uh, made the first flight of the second prototype. And you notice this has the single propellers and was a much more successful airplane. Here you see the uh, configuration. It really looks like a P-38 on steroids, but that forward pod uh, housed the cameras in the, uh, in the nose section and it didn't have the room and the uh, access to the camera systems that the rainbow did. Here's a size comparison in a Tony Landis uh, profile drawing and you see the XF-11 was uh, quite a bit smaller than the uh, XR-12. On July 10th of 1947, uh, Ship One was making uh, high sink max uh, weight uh, landings at Farmingdale. And uh, with an Air Force crew, uh, the right landing gear sheared off in one of the high impact landings. And so uh, the airplane circled the field for a few hours to burn off fuel and then made an emergency landing, uh, which was successful. It uh, basically ground looped onto another runway, but it uh, remained intact. And it was really a, a testimony to the construction of the airplane because it was fully loaded with uh, full uh, max fuel uh, uh, when the uh, airplane landed and the wheel sheared off but the airframe stayed intact, which was really uh, quite a tribute to the, uh, the, the folks at Republic building a really solid airplane. The second uh, XR-12 was a more advanced machine uh, in that it contained a complete operational photographic interior, cameras, onboard photo lab. We'll show you that in a moment. And here it is, uh, it uh, made its first flight on August 12th of 1947. Uh, the Air Force was created in September that year. And here you can see uh, in uh, early 1948 at uh, Farmingdale, this view looking down from the control tower uh, shows the airplane in the now US Air Force markings with the new uh, national insignia. I might mention that the airplane at the top of the photo is uh, the Independence, that is President Harry Truman's uh, DC-6, a name for Independence of Missouri, his hometown. We're gonna take you aboard the uh, second prototype and show you the interior. This is the navigator station where he had uh, controls for the cameras as well as the uh, lead photo operator who sat in this uh, station in the fuselage and had uh, intervalometers and all sorts of camera controls uh, at his, uh, his right-hand side there. Uh, this is a vertical camera. It's a Fairchild K22. And uh, this looks straight down and takes the images like you saw at the beginning of this presentation. Behind that is what is called a trimetrigon, which is a vertical camera and then two oblique cameras. And it basically takes a wide angle uh, photo of the target uh, in, uh, in this uh, position. And last is the uh, twin telephoto uh, Fairchild K22s with 40 inch lenses. I might mention that the shutter speeds on these cameras are about one three hundredth of a second. You notice the uh, 
structure in the middle of the cabin there on the right hand side. And that is a dark room, which allowed the crew to uh, develop the photos it was taking in the air and have them ready to present to the battlefield commanders as the airplane landed. This was a huge step forward. Here we see the bottom of the aft fuselage with the photo windows. It had uh, rotating uh, uh, covers that uh, uh, kept them uh, sealed in flight. The windows were heated for anti-icing. And the uh, forward, the large forward bay that you see at the right of the, fuse of the uh, photograph uh, contained the photo flash flares that were used for nighttime photography. In October of 1948, uh, Ship 2 was flown to Wright-Patterson Air Force Base for testing. And here it is uh, at an air show in late October. You see the uh, public, uh, you get a good idea of the, the size of the airplane with the uh, uh, people below. And after that air show, the airplane was flown to Eglin Air Force Base in Pensacola, Florida for evaluation of the photo systems and uh, training of the Air Force crews. On Sunday, November 7th of 1948, on the second flight at Eglin, uh, as the airplane was preparing to return to land uh, over the Gulf of Mexico, there was a fuel leak in the number two engine and that developed into a fire and the airplane became uncontrollable. Uh, the seven man crew was able to bail out, although I should say one uh, person was trapped in the airplane and sadly another was lost in the uh, ocean, unable to jettison his parachute in the high winds and he perished as well. Uh, it was an unfortunate day, a uh, sad day for Republic, sad day for the Air Force, but uh, the more advanced of the two airplanes was lost in that accident on November 7th. Had the airplane gone into production, it would have been called the F-12. This is the F-12A. It's uh, fitted with even higher performance uh, engines with what they call VDT, variable discharge turbines, which would have given this airplane a uh, top speed of 500 miles per hour. Pretty impressive for a propeller driven aircraft, but still not as fast as the jets that were uh, coming into service. And this was the death knell for the airplane. Uh, in January of 1949, the Air Force canceled the contract. They even talked about uh, converting the fuselage into a jet powered aircraft, but that did not come to pass. And then there was the airliner version, the RC-2. And this bears some, uh, some examination. The RC-1, uh, or the Thunderbolt Amphibian was a uh, light airplane intended for the general aviation market at the end of the war. The RC-2 was the airliner, as you see here in model form in Pan Am uh, markings. And the RC-3 uh, was the production version of the amphibian and that was renamed the CB. It was an aggressive marketing push to foreign airlines for the Rainbow. Would have been the world's fastest airliner at that time. Uh, it advanced to the mock-up stage, which you see here in a slightly different nose configuration. And uh, it even garnered orders from uh, Pan American World Airways and American Airlines. American uh, went so far as to put it into ads for the coming uh, Republic Rainbow flagship. And as uh, was vogue of the time, uh, the airplane was always uh, depicted as uh, this cavernous interior with cathedral ceilings and all the amenities. But uh, it was a, a glimpse into the future because this is certainly where uh, commercial aviation was headed. The RC-2 carried 40 passengers. It was not a uh, lavishly large airplane, much like the Concorde. It was a high performance machine, fairly small on the inside. Uh, here's how it would have looked uh, compared to the other airliners of the era. From the top, we had the Constellation, the DC-6, the uh, Stratocruiser, and at the bottom was the Rainbow, different shape. The problem was at the end of World War II, uh, military transports like the C-54 and the C-47 uh, became uh, available for uh, very, very reasonable prices. You could buy a surplus DC-4 for $90,000 in those years. And uh, so airlines took advantage of that and had these machines converted into passenger configurations like you see here at LaGuardia Airport. By comparison, the Rainbow cost 1.25 million in those uh, dollars. And uh, in this photo, which I consider one of the most ironic images I've ever, ever seen, you've got the rainbow at the left and Republic wound up with a multi-million dollar contract to convert C-54 Skymasters into DC-4 airliners for American Airlines. Had the airplane gone into service with Pan Am, you see here it is the Clipper Rainbow, uh, its chief competition really would have been the Boeing Stratocruiser. 
And let's take a moment and compare the two airplanes. Uh, the Stratocruiser was powered by the 4360s, held 86 passengers, weighed 145,000 pounds at takeoff, had a range of 3,000 miles and a cruise speed of 340 miles per hour. By comparison, the Rainbow, same engines, but carried less than half the payload. It was a smaller and lighter airplane at 115,000 pound max gross takeoff weight, but the range was 4,000 miles, 1,000 miles longer than the Stratocruiser, and the speed was nearly 100 miles an hour greater than the Stratocruiser. Bottom line, operating costs trumped the speed of the airplane, and the cost won out. Just like the four machines you see here from upper left, the Convair 990, the French Super Caravelle, which was merged into the British Concorde, or the British French Concorde, I should say, and the uh, Boeing uh, uh, Sonic Cruiser, uh, which all promised great speed. The 990, of course, was built. There were only 37 of them built. Burned a lot of gas, carried 120 passengers, was not an economical airplane, although one of the most beautiful airliners ever created. The Concorde served from 1976 to 2003. And uh, at the end of its run, a one-way ticket across the Atlantic was approaching $10,000. So you can see that uh, speed was expensive. And in the end, uh, all these airplanes gave way to uh, slower airplanes that were just more economical to operate. So what would have happened if the uh, Rainbow had gone into service? Well, here's some uh, examples from Tony Landis. Uh, you have the uh, tanker version. I guess they would have called it the KC-12. Uh, here's an early warning uh, radar Connie type uh, configuration. And an ELINT uh, photo recon version as it would have looked had it flown uh, during the Vietnam War. But the solution to the Air Force's problem of a high speed long range airplane came in the form of uh, the B-47 or in this case the RB-47 which uh, was a, uh, a jet uh, aircraft uh, that was uh, refuelable in flight and gave the uh, US Air Force the capability to fly anywhere in the world and uh, conduct photo recon missions. Uh, by the mid 1950s, you had the Lockheed U-2. The 60s uh, produced the SR-71, a Mach 3.2 uh, aircraft. And today we have unmanned machines like the Global Hawk and of course satellites that provide amazing capability that would be considered uh, science fiction in the days of the XR-12. Ship One uh, was flown by the Air Force in various uh, missions uh, after it was repaired from the landing gear accident, and it actually flew until 1951. At the end of its career, it was uh, flown to the Aberdeen Proving Grounds uh, in Maryland, and sadly, it was blown up as a ground target for artillery practice. So neither of the two airplanes ever survived. But the Rainbow was the world's fastest four-engine piston-powered airplane, Unfortunately, it was the right airplane at the wrong time. And there you have the story of Republic's XR-12. Thank you for celebrating aviation with Mike Machat. As always, special thanks to the wonderful folks who made this presentation possible. My friends, Tony Landis, Dennis Jenkins, and Joshua Stoff, the curator of the Cradle of Aviation Museum at Mitchell Field on Long Island. I hope you enjoyed this presentation. And until next time, Take care.